most couples have some version of this battle for fairness that's running in the background constantly, usually unconscious. You don't even see that it's happening. That's Nate Clemp, the New York Times bestselling author, featured guest on this week's episode of the Shine On Podcast. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? We're going to pull back the curtain on the divorce process, the mistakes and the missteps. How can couples navigate the divorce process? Can you still divorce in a healthy way? The conversation is as good as it gets. It's fun, insightful. It will change the way you think about your life and how to tackle life's challenges. The Shine On Podcast, season three. Episode 54 of the Shine On Podcast. I'm Evan Shine. We are coming off an absolutely terrific second season. And today, we start season number three here on the Shine On Podcast. Happy 2023, everyone. And producer Dave, happy new year. And wow, do we have an amazing season coming up on the podcast. I agree on both accounts. I hope you are having a happy new year. And uh, I'm excited for the season. We've got a couple of tweaks, a couple of changes, and some great guests coming up. The show marches on. And Dave, we start season three in a big way. We lead off today's episode with the docket, followed by a new segment on the podcast this year, Ask Evan. And then I sit down with Nate Klemp, co-author of the incredible book, The 80-80 Marriage. What an absolute treat to start the new year in season three to have Nate Klemp join us on the podcast. And speaking of the new year, there's a lot of talk about the new year and divorce. A lot of buzz about new year, new me, new <laughs> year's resolutions, new year's goals. People sit down, Dave, you know this, and they make their list, their new year's list, their goals, their resolutions, projects, things to accomplish. And on any of these lists, you will often find things such as work on my marriage, schedule a session, the long overdue session with the couple's therapist, initiate a divorce, or please, judge, pretty please, let this be the year, the year that you finally sign off on my divorce papers after three years, four years battling my ex. Let 2023 be the year that I am finally, finally divorced. And look, people often say divorce month is now, that January is divorce month. Right now, you can't Google divorce in the new year without seeing article after article pop up. And look, everyone on social media loves to talk about how January is officially divorce month. But is it? Is January really divorce month? Do attorneys, judges, and those in the divorce trenches really see a huge spike in this month, in January, in divorce filings? And look, to answer this question, let's separate fact from fiction. Where does this idea that January is divorce month come from? In part, look, it's the goals. It's the resolution list. And because the new year symbolizes a fresh start and a clean slate, People often stick it out during the holidays and the months of November and December before we say hello to a new year. And look, there's some truth to this and legitimacy on the reasons people wait to file. And sure, you can find some statistic and some numbers that would support the new filings of a divorce that show some increase in the month of January. But in reality, saying January is divorce month is more fiction than fact. I love a good statistic, but Dave, his numbers only tell one part of the story. And sometimes very small and very insignificant part of that story. First, the act of just filing for a divorce from a legal standpoint is just one small step in what can be a very long and often several year divorce process. Second, the legal significance of filing, stopping the clock on the duration of marital assets happens whenever a divorce filing takes place, so tying it to the new year makes absolutely no difference. Third, there needs to be a plan, a well-thought-out plan, and there's so much more to think about or to include on the divorce goal list before actually filing. Your children, the timing, the impact, financial considerations, 
So for anyone who says, start the new year off right and just file, you're totally missing all the other real and relevant considerations and strategy that must be discussed with an attorney before you just file. And finally, every month is divorce month. There is not <laughs> one single month that I can point to that's actually quiet. In fact, I've seen a huge increase in people filing for divorce over the summer with the children out of the home, often in sleep away camp. People like to have a plan in place for when the children come back, even if it's not a final plan and just a short-term plan, a plan that both parents have already discussed and both parents have figured out the best way to communicate this plan to the children. And Dave, we can talk about New Year's goals and New Year's resolutions all day long. But before we get into a docket that's filled with New Year's resolutions and New Year's advice, let me tell you how I spent my Christmas week. Mm. And look at this, the holidays, they're always busy. In fact, there hasn't been one Christmas day where there has not been some issue about holiday pickup and drop-offs or travel plans or something about who doesn't take the children to Florida or the Caribbean. And this year was no different. Christmas morning, Sunday, December 25th, 9.27 a.m. The email this year, it came in early. A parent was refusing to drop off the child for Christmas Day. Mm. The week before, I was scheduled for trial on a divorce litigation that has gone on for so long. When the litigation first started, the Giants beat your New England Patriots in the Super Bowl oh. in Indianapolis in 2012. <laughs> And Dave, for the starting quarterbacks for those teams, Eli Manning, mm -hmm. he's been retired for a handful of years. <laughs> and, and Tom Brady won a Super Bowl with a different team, retired, unretired. <laughs> and oh, by the way, got divorced. And we don't know if he's coming back in 2023. That's how long this divorce mm -hmm. was going on. <clears throat> Think about that. And with 12 hours until I was about to call my first witness, the case settled. And look. Despite everything I mentioned, I did try to take a little time off, recharge, regroup. I went with my family on a quick trip to lovely Philadelphia. Ah. Great, great time. Great city. But even when I tried to take just a little break, small break, I'm never fully out of it. I stayed, Dave, at a great, fantastic hotel in downtown Philly. And look, outside one window, I have a Christmas tree and the beautiful lights. And then outside the other window was the family court of Philadelphia. I can't, <laughs> I can't escape the family court of divorce world, even when I try to take a break. And then the icing on the cake is this story. My wife and daughter, we go out to dinner, Ocean Prime, great spot. Mm. Table next to me, husband and wife in this big, large round booth. Mm. You think you would sit fairly close to one another, have a cocktail or two, smiling, laughing. Mm. Dave, it was the exact opposite. Husband, wife, opposite sides of the table, barely speaking. My <laughs> wife jokes that they could use my card and only if we were in New York City. Right. Silence. Look, it was interrupting our meal. I mean, it was hard to ignore. Mm. And then, finally, the divorce talk came. I couldn't believe it. Mm. The conversation that starts with the following. I have given this a lot of thought. And I got to tell you, after hearing two minutes of this, my Chilean sea bass in the mac and cheese <laughs> went cold. And my first thought was clearly the wife spoke with a divorce coach or an attorney on how to have the conversation. Mm. Give it up for the wife. All right. And my, and my wife's first thought was how sad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And my daughter's first thought was, dad, can I have the mac and cheese if you're not going <laughs> to eat it? And look, this is just a snippet of what the wow. end of the year looks like for me. But Dave, how was your break and how was your holiday? It was fine. It was peaceful compared to yours. It's funny what you said reminded me of a uh, dinner I was at with my wife at the time. We were still married and we were sitting next to another couple at a restaurant and they were near silent and the silence was deafening. And just like you said, it's hard to ignore. You could feel the stress in the air. And the only one who was speaking of the two of them was the wife. And she was criticizing him for various things. You'd hear her quiet down, and then you'd hear her say, oh, and, and your sister. I mean, don't get me started on your sister and what that woman's up to. And uh, we labeled him crushed spirit, man, and we said a prayer for him and hope he may. But that is interesting. It's sort of interesting that you noticed those little 
snapshots. My holiday was fine. Um, I'm just happy my younger son Griffin is home from UMass, and we've got to hang out. And I gave him for his gift a VR goggles, Oculus Quest, the the fancy VR goggles, so that now when he's away at college, we can still play virtual miniature golf. That's the plan. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And Dave, let's get right into the first docket of 2023. Let's do it. And now, let's see what's on the docket. Well, the docket machine had a busy 2022, but it is primed and ready for 2023. And let's get started. We return to the celebrity world of divorce, an item about Drew Barrymore that comes to us from usatoday.com. Item one. Headline reads, Drew Barrymore says she turned to alcohol after divorce before finding real happiness. The actress says she's finding happiness after the crippling effect for years that followed her divorce from Will Copelman in 2016. And she shared this uh, information with people. The lovely and yet perhaps troubled, off-troubled Drew Barrymore. Your thoughts, Evan? Dave, look, if you're going through a divorce or you're just starting that new chapter after a divorce and you're struggling, you're struggling to hold it together, you're struggling to co-parent, you're struggling to find time for yourself or be the best version of yourself. Look, you're not alone. And one of the reasons I love articles like this and hearing the stories that we talked about in 2022 and we'll continue to do that in 2023 is because articles like this, Dave, it normalizes what so many people are going through. And for people going through the divorce process, you are not alone. But if you can start the new year and put it on your list of New Year's goals and New Year's resolutions, start the new year on finding happiness, finding that thing that brings you joy and brings you happiness. And look, Drew Barrymore opens up and she's candid about the struggle. She refers to the years that followed her divorce as crippling, difficult years. She talks about how it was a messy, painful, an excruciating walk through the fire. I mean, that, that sums it up for so many people. And she uses that description and really those powerful words, because for so many people, Dave, it really is one of the most difficult times and whether it's during the process or after the process, I think it's so hard. And I think people just think that because you get a signed judgment of divorce back and you're officially divorced, the hard work's over and you can start this new chapter. But in many ways, there is that crash. There is that struggle in the time period that follows the finalization of the divorce. All right, Evan, we move on to the next item on the docket. Item two. So for this particular part of the docket, and I credit you, Evan, with uh, some excellent show planning here and show prep, we are uh, each going to provide one piece of advice for the new year. If you're thinking about the divorce process, identify your goals and communicate those goals to your attorney. Look, those goals may change based on several factors, financial, parenting schedules, other considerations, and things that come up, but have a real candid conversation with your attorney and explain what you're looking for and what your goals are in the divorce process. And Dave, the listeners have spoken. The listeners wanted more producer Dave. <laughs> so let's give them more producer Dave. So Dave, someone who's been through the process before, can you give the listeners, mm -hmm. someone going through a divorce, piece of advice, a nugget of wisdom? Yeah, I'll give sort of a two-part piece of advice. And it goes like this. Don't underestimate small kindnesses that you can extend to your ex. And the piece of advice that goes hand in hand with it is pick your battles. In other words, there are going to be things, it's every divorce, no matter how amicable, you know, stressful, ang anxious moments in the years to come. And there are going to be things that you don't care about and then things that you really do care about certain holidays. You absolutely want to spend the kids spend with the kids, certain nights you want to take them people you want in their lives, etc. And then they're going to be things you don't care about those things. You don't care about 
just give them to your ex-spouse. I never was particularly in love with Thanksgiving. And so when my ex said, I'd really like to bring the kids to Philadelphia for Thanksgiving, I said, go for it. And then she's done that every year since. And so, and then those little kindnesses and those little moments where you give something to your ex-spouse, they will come back to you in spades. You'll be shocked. But I love that. And it's brilliant because when you're in the moment, it's so hard, right? right? It's so hard to be in a position to do just that. And yet there's going to be times where I'm sure things came up where flexibility was so important and you have that co-parenting relationship. And if you say no, or you refuse to compromise or you refuse to be flexible, you're not going to get that flexibility back. You're not going to get those acts of kindness back from your ex when you really need it. So it's a two way street, but in that moment, how hard is it to realize that Things are going to come up, times are going to come up, moments are going to come up where you're going to need the flexibility from the other side. Yeah, you got to fight your instincts if you're at each other's throats, and a lot of times you will be, and sometimes you want to say to yourself, well, this isn't fair, and in fact, maybe it's not fair. Maybe it's not fair you take the kids for an extra weekend just because something came up in your your ex-spouse's life, but if you can do it, do it because it'll pay it paid it paid me back just this past year my ex got covid and it was a weekend she was scheduled to keep our son and i was supposed to go on a canoe trip with the boys and i said to myself what am i gonna do i can't leave my son home with my wife with with covid so i took him on the canoe trip it, t- it turned out to be kind of a, a different kind of canoe trip <laughs> but it was fun <laughs> but it's still fun and then later in the year <laughs> of course i got covid and she dropped everything and she said, don't worry about anything. I'll take care of everything the kids need. So there are going to be those moments. And if you, maybe there's someone else you can turn to when it comes to these things, your parents or my parents happen to be getting up there in age. So that, that option has become a little tenuous. You're going to want that. Hey, what do I have to do to get a trip on invite on the canoe trip? I'll put you on the list. Yeah. Um, You're talking about a trip with the boys, a trip with the guys. I mean, I, I'm sitting here on the other side of the mic on the shot on podcast thinking, what about me? I I think you've you've earned your, your spot on, on the river, Evan, and my people will be in touch with yours. As long as you <laughs> promise that you have life jackets on the... Yes, they're required. And uh, we move on to the third item today. Item three. We're up to the last item on the docket, and appropriately, first episode of the year, New Year's resolution. Some people love them, they hate them, but we all make them, I think. Evan, what's yours? I'm going to give you a New Year's resolution that I really hope if you're going through a divorce, you listen and you follow. And Dave, you touched on it in the last segment. Think big picture. Don't sweat the small stuff. See the forest through the trees. Whatever line you like, take it and apply it to your divorce. There is so much value, tremendous value on looking ahead, starting this new chapter, being flexible, finalizing this moment in your life, finalizing this time period, don't get caught up in the small battle. Five years, 10 years, 20 years later, I promise you, I promise you, and Dave, you'll tell them, Mm. you're not going to remember that battle. It's not going to be worth it. Find a way to make 2023 the year you think big picture, and you move ahead, you move forward. Mm. Excellent one. Mine is similar, and also, I think, apropos of this podcast and the topic of divorce, and my resolution is going to be at least once a week, get in touch with an old friend that I wish I hadn't lost touch with. They say life is about relationships, and divorce is the end of a relationship, and your relationship's never going to be the same with your ex, and sometimes that, and sometimes you lose a lot of friends. I certainly did. It wasn't anything nasty. It was just, uh, I should have known that I wasn't going to see the Goldsteins after I got divorced because we went out as couples. So, but you know, we can always reach out to an old friend, an old college friend, or even a cousin that we rarely talk to. And I want to avoid those moments where I'm reminded of someone and I say, yeah, geez, I love that guy. How come I haven't talked to him in three years? Shame on me. I'm going to fix that this year. We are up to the portion of the program where we hear from you, the listeners in the segment we call ask Evan. Ask Evan. Ask Evan. Ask Evan. 
Today's edition of Ask Evan, we have a note from Janice in Staten Island. And Janice has the following to say, Evan, what do you think the biggest misconceptions are about divorce? Janice, I love the question. And look, I'm going to give you two. The first misconception is that every divorce has to be a knockdown, drag out, nasty divorce. Look, divorce is not what you see in the movies. Sure, it can be. And often it gets ugly. But as someone who lives in a courtroom litigating, I see that side of it more than others. But if you approach divorce the right way, the right attorneys are involved from the beginning. Often the divorce can be handled out of court and things can be negotiated without ever stepping foot in a courtroom. Misconception number two, that there's only one way to get divorced. Of course you can get divorced other ways. There isn't one way to do anything and divorce is no exception. In New York and so many other states, there's three ways to get divorced litigation, mediation, and the collaborative law process, and all over the country. You're seeing the increase and rise of mediation and collaborative law. So why do so many people, Janice, not know about these other options? You have to research. You have to educate yourself. You have to find an attorney who can explain the different process choices to you and really care about finding the best path forward and the right divorce process for you. That's another edition of Ask Evan. If you want to submit a question for Evan to answer on the podcast, email producer Dave at david at pod617.com. Our featured guest on this week's episode of the Shine On Podcast is Nate Clem. Nate is a New York Times bestselling author, philosopher, coach, founding partner at Mindful Magazine, and co-author with his wife, Kaylee Klemp, of the book, The 8080 Marriage, A New Model for a Happier, Stronger Marriage. The book was selected by the New York Times as an editor's choice, and it's absolutely terrific. Nate, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with us. So good to be here, Evan. Thanks for having me. Of course, and Ned, I'm excited to have you on the podcast. We're going to talk marriage and really dive into your book, The 8080 Marriage, which you co-authored with your wife. So first, let me ask you, what inspired you to write the book? Well, it was really born out of our own personal struggle, I guess you could say. My wife and I have been married for about 18 years now. And one of the things that happened very early on is we found that we were in constant conflict. And then when we had a child, that conflict was amplified in all sorts of ways. We were fighting over who got more time with the extended family, fighting over free time on the weekends, money, everything you can imagine. And we actually got to the point where we almost got divorced and our marriage almost ended. But what happened as we sort of looked at the sources of all of that conflict is that we started to see a pattern. And the pattern was this, that all of these fights in one way or another were essentially fights over fairness, over whether things were perfectly 50-50 fair. And then we decided to zoom out and just to see, are we the only ones who are dealing with this predicament or is this something that's happening in most modern marriages? So we ended up interviewing about 100 people and found that in varying degrees, most couples have some version of this battle for fairness that's running in the background constantly, usually unconscious. You don't even see that it's happening. And that one of the key unlocks for marriage and relationships is seeing it, but then shifting to an alternative model. And Nate, you mentioned the source of conflict in your own marriage and relationship and some of the common things, money, kids, how people spend the time. As you think back early on, before you were married or really early on in the early years, life before kids, mm. were there conversations that you think you should have had that you didn't, that would have made certain situations or, you know, how you handled conflict a bit easier? I think one of the key conversations would have been around how to shift from a life together that's happening by accident, which is how most marriages and relationships unfold, the, the structure of roles in a marriage, 
the mindset, whether that's fairness or radical generosity, the, the structure of power, the way you think about money. In most marriages, that all happens by accident. It's just random forces, gender norms from the 1950s, or just sheer historical accident. One person started taking out the trash and now they're the trash person. And, and the problem with things happening by accident is that there's a way in which it leads to a, a design that could be inefficient, a design that, that could be a recipe for conflict. And so the big shift or the big conversation that I wish we had had, and I encourage all couples to have, is around how can you shift from a life that's happening by accident to a life together that's really happening by design, that's more intentional. And Dane, I, I would think that those conversations, whether you have them sort of in the beginning of your marriage, but those are conversations that, look, if you're going to stay married until death do us part, those are constant conversations that married couples, they have to have, whether it's you have a child, you might have a second child, there's money issues, job loss. I mean, things, marriage is hard. Absolutely. So you're right that those conversations are continual. It's not like you do it once when you're first married and then you're done and you can just coast off that momentum. It's something that, that has to happen all the time. And I think that the big problem that happens for many couples is they think we're too busy. We don't have time for this conversation. Or they think marriage should be easy. We don't need to work at this. That's, that's kind of the cultural aspiration is that once you get married, everything kind of falls into place magically. And so as a result, instead of having these conversations where we're thinking, how do we win together as a team? We end up having conversations that are more based on criticism or resentment, or this isn't fair. And those are the kinds of conversations that really fuel this cycle of conflict that can, can get worse over time. And Nate, you mentioned sort of fairness or this idea and perception that people have fairness equals a percentage. And generally, the percentage that goes with that for many people is 50-50. Your book, The 80-80 Marriage, has a different percentage. So I'm sure at some point people said, hey, Nate, if you add up 80 and 80, that totals more than 100. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, the math, right? So, yeah. so tell us about that concept and where does the 50-50 model fall short? Yeah, I, I think it's important to start with 50-50 because there's something really special happening in our generation. We are the first generation of couples to aspire toward egalitarian marriage. So in other words, we're the first generation that's asking, how can we be equals and in love? This is a question that if you look back to your grandparents or your great-grandparents, that question was unimaginable. They were never asking that question. So for the first time in human history, we have this new problem to solve, which is how can we be equals and in love? And the default answer that's offered by our culture is to say, well, if we just make everything perfectly 50-50 fair, somehow we will ascend into the heavens of marital bliss and it's going to be amazing and we'll never have any problems, right? This is certainly <laughs> our mentality. Yeah. yeah, this was our mentality when we first got married. It was like, okay, if we can just make everything fair, this is going to be perfect. Now, the problem with this model gets to a really interesting finding in psychology, which is that it turns out when it comes to our perceptions of fairness in relationships, we have all of these cognitive biases that essentially get in the way of these judgments of what is or isn't fair. So one of these is availability bias, which is basically just a fancy way of saying, in my marriage, all the wonderful things that I do, all of that information is available to me. I see it all happening in real time. But when it comes to my wife, Kaylee, her contributions are murkier, especially from my side. Many of them I don't even see, I don't know about. I'm not even aware that they're happening. So I'm gonna have this systematic bias toward thinking I did more. And then there's also what they found, which is called the overestimation bias, which is where we tend to overestimate the amount of time that we spend on things like childcare and household work, right? So I may say I spent an hour and a half cleaning up the house. It's probably more like 45 minutes, right? We just have this tendency to exaggerate. And so as a result, if you think about then these arguments we're having about fairness, we're basically both bringing to the table assessments of fairness that are based on pure delusion, pure cognitive bias, right? We have no idea what is or isn't fair, what our partner is actually doing, 
And that's why this argument or this battle for fairness never goes away. It's an unwinnable war. And I would think coming off the pandemic, when people were working remotely and people were spending more time together, arguably since their honeymoon, this was even a harder conversation where roles, responsibility was blended, separation from being in the office and, and coming home and spending time with family. That separation evaporated perhaps at a greater pace than we've ever seen over the past few years. Absolutely. I think the pandemic is a great example of a disruptive event that for most couples, it turned the, the habits that they had running in the background on their head overnight. And then again, and that could be an opportunity for shifting from that accidental approach to a more intentional approach. But I think for most of us, it was so stressful and everything was moving so fast that the disruption led to even more accidental arrangements of roles and of expectations and priorities. And for many couples, that, that just made things worse and intensified this argument over what is or isn't fair. Nate, so I have to ask you, what was it like to write a book and do all the research with your wife? Well, it turned out to be an amazing experience. There was certainly fear at the beginning that if we did this together, this might lead to the end of our marriage or a lot of conflict. <laughs> I mean, it was funny, actually, when I told people, hey, the next book I'm writing is going to be about marriage and it's going to be with my wife. Everybody, people would come out of the woodwork basically saying, don't do that. I knew this one couple, they started a podcast together and they got divorced the next year. Like somehow writing about marriage is kind of touching this, this untouchable kryptonite, a Pandora's box that you don't ever want to open. But it really wasn't that way for us. It was, it was actually amazing because these tools that we were writing about were tools that were helping us every single day as we were navigating our own life, our own priorities, our own roles, our own conflicts and disagreements. So it ended up for us being this kind of amazing thing. And, and we still talk about this model. It's been two years since the book came out, but every day we're talking about like, what's the 80-80 solution to this, that, that sort of thing. And I'll tell you, if you could write a book together and stay together, look, you could survive anything, right? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> what did you learn from the research and the interviews and, and working with Kaylee on the book, what did you learn about her that you may not yeah. have realized before? And also, what did you learn about yourself? I think in terms of what I learned about Kaylee, the main thing I learned was I got, a inner, I got an insight into how she works. And I think that's kind of unique in a married couple when you have different careers and different jobs. You, know, you see each other around the kitchen table or at social events but you don't actually see the other person in the midst of work. You don't understand their style of work, how they think, how they process information, how you react when you're doing an interview that's super intense, right? We got to go on Good Morning America together and, and go through that whole kind of crazy, sure. stressful situation. So it was really just this insight into, into how she works and how, how she worked together. And I think that for me, it was really learning about my own habits and patterns in relationships in a new way that I, much of the way I thought about relationship was shaped in that accidental manner and tinged with these gender norms from the 1950s. And so the project of writing a book together on relationships and marriage really gave me this opportunity to question all of these assumptions and think about if we wanted to design this in the best possible way, how would we do it? Versus what are just my baseline assumptions and the, the thoughts I've been socialized into? No, I love that. Nate, let me ask you, during the research for the book, were there certain common themes that you saw with the people you interviewed time and time again in terms of the consistent struggles and troubles that the subjects that you interviewed experienced? Yeah, and I think this gets to a really important point because we talked about 50-50, which is where we are right now. This is the, the sort of cultural default. And the model as, that we offer as an alternative, 80-80, is important here because in some ways that was the differentiator when we were interviewing couples between the couples that were thriving and the couples that were really struggling. So the, the ones that were really struggling and finding themselves locked in resentment they were falling into that pattern of fairness that I was describing earlier. 
The couples that were really thriving, on the other hand, were the couples who were operating on something more like an 80-80 model of marriage. And just to explain what that means, because you were asking about the math, like that adds up to 160. <laughs> How is that even possible? The, the basic idea is that because the force of that 50-50 fairness mindset is so intense, if we want to shift the underlying culture of relationship, we need to shift the goalposts or shift our own aspirations from doing 50% or what's fair to doing something radical. We think that's something like 80%, right? I, I want to contribute to my marriage and our life together at 80%. And, and that's a mindset that looks less like fairness and more like what we call radical generosity. So the idea being that hey, if I can aspire toward that, knowing that it's impossible, right? We can't both be contributing at 80%. The math doesn't work. It makes no sense. But in some ways, that's the kind of shift in aspiration that we need if we want to radically tra or transform the, the culture of a relationship. Because then the, the basic idea or the basic mindset isn't founded around this idea of making everything fair. It's based on the idea of shifting to a radical culture of generosity. How does someone go about making that switch? Someone who's been married 10 years, 15 years, picks up a copy of your book, looks at marriage, fairness, 50-50. What's the conversation to, that has to take place to now start applying the 80-80 model? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because as you say, for somebody who's been in a relationship for 15 years, this would be a pretty radical departure from their ordinary habits. And, you know, this idea of radical generosity, it can sound very abstract, but I think we can boil it down to some really tactical pieces. So the first piece is what you might think of as contribution. Imagine every day doing one act of contribution for your partner that's really small. So this isn't like, buying them tickets to go to Fiji together or the Taylor Swift concert, which nobody can get tickets to. <laughs> this is something actually very small. This could be getting them their cup of coffee in the morning. This could be writing, I love you on a sticky note and putting it on their monitor, right? It's very small, but doing something like that once a day, it's radically generous and it has this sort of contagious effect of making your partner more likely to be generous toward you. So that would be one thing. The second is appreciation, which I think might be like the most important relationship hack. And basically what I mean by appreciation is we have this tendency in relationships to view our partner through the glasses of everything that they're doing wrong, right? So we, we see all the ways they fell short or the things they didn't do or the things they didn't say. And appreciation is really about flipping those glasses on their head and really looking for how is my partner contributing to our life together? And then when you see that, expressing that as an appreciation and being specific here, I think is really powerful. So not just like, hey, you really did a lot of cool things today, but like, hey, I really noticed how you took the time with our daughter today to help her with her math homework. And, and she seemed to really appreciate that. And so the, the more specific you can be, the better. One last one I've just thrown in, another tactic of radical generosity is about revealing. And this is one area where a lot of couples get into trouble. Over time, they, they sort of talk about things happening in the external world, what's happening at work, what's happening in the news, and they forget to talk about what's happening in their inner world, right? What are they looking forward to? What, what are the emotions that are happening? And so revealing those kinds of things can be really powerful. And especially sometimes revealing those moments where things go wrong, where you feel like your, your feelings were hurt or there was a misunderstanding. Revealing that in a clean way so you get back into connection can be incredibly powerful. And, and so those are like three tactics people can use to really start to make that change in a sort of everyday basis. I love that. What evolution have you seen in your own marriage by applying the 80-80 concept? I think the biggest evolution is a shift in thinking. So part of our generation living in this era is living in a time when we were growing up, we were told, you need to be the best you can be. You need to do something special. You need to achieve something amazing as an individual. And so 
going into marriage, Kaylee and I both thought about our life in a very individual fashion. We need to be successful as individuals. Oh, and I guess we should do this marriage thing as well. And I think the biggest shift is really seeing that the, the most powerful way to be together and to succeed together is to shift from that individual mindset of winning alone to something more like winning together or shared success is what we call it in the book. So it's this idea of instead of asking what's best for me when we reach a really challenging decision or a, a point where we have a crossroads in life, it's asking what's best for us. And we even go so far as naming our family. So our family has a name, it's Kajona. K-A for Kaylee, J-O for our daughter, N-A for me. And, and what's cool about that name is it allows us to ask, what's best for Kajona, right? Like even if it's an individual thing happening in my career, we'll ask, what's best for Kajona? And the answer to that question is totally different than the questions we were asking earlier on. What's best for me? What's best for my career? Who's the book intended for? Is it someone on the verge of getting married, someone who's been married and, and, and they're in year one, year two, they're in that honeymoon phase? Or is it people who have been together that are just going through the motions day in, day out, looking for the spark, they're living life in somewhat of a robotic fashion? Who's the book intended for? I think the book is really intended for all of those groups. So it, it really is helpful at any stage. As we talked about earlier, if you're for, at the beginning of a relationship, thinking intentionally about how you structure your life together can be incredibly powerful. And what a great time to start off with good habits that serve you. But for many of us, we didn't have that opportunity and we fell into some bad habits. And so if you're coming at this later on, it's also never too late to start asking some of these questions and start thinking about how do we make that shift from accidental structures and mindsets in our relationship to something more intentional. I guess what I would say is the book is written primarily for couples that are really looking for ways to optimize their relationship together and, and get more connected. It's not so much a book for couples that are right at the very edges of divorce or in the midst of really deep intractable conflict. I think for if, if that's your experience, then something like, Marriage counseling, marriage family therapy is really the ideal thing for couples that are in crisis. But this would be a book for couples that are not necessarily in crisis, but just looking to improve and looking to get closer and, and experience more intimacy and love. Nate, what's the one piece of advice you wish someone told you when you got married? I think the most important piece of advice that I would have liked to have heard when we were first getting married is the importance of trying to do more than your fair share. And I know that's a theme I keep talking about, but what I didn't understand is that by acting from a spirit of generosity, not only could I change my experience of my life in a relationship because I didn't feel, wouldn't feel as much resentment, wouldn't be lost in conflict, but I can also change my wife's experience in the relationship because I think one of the, the most essential things we found through all of these interviews for the book is that our mindset in relationships is contagious. So if your mindset is one of fairness and resentment, that's contagious. Your partner is likely to mirror that back to you at every turn, right? The more you aspire toward fairness and the more you resent your partner because they're not giving you complete, perfect fairness, the more they're going to sort of feel like things aren't fair and resent you. And, and the thing that I wish I had understood is that by engaging in a relationship from this spirit of generosity, you're creating this contagious effect. It almost, it, you can think of it like an upward spiral where my acts of generosity make it much easier for my wife, Kaylee, to act in a generous way, which in turn makes me more likely to be generous. And and it kind of just has this upward spiral effect. And so I think that idea that, that your mindset is contagious and really thinking about like, what is my mindset? How am I approaching relationship? And how is that being mirrored back to me by my partner? That, that's something that I wish I had looked at more carefully. It would have saved me a lot of personal suffering and, and conflict in our <laughs> marriage together.
Nate, I know you're a coach and you work with a lot of people one-on-one. Tell us, how does your approach, given your background, how does it differ from that of a typical coach? Well, I would say that at the base of my approach and the way I think about all things, relationships, life, et cetera, is mindfulness. So my training over the last 15 years, since I was a professor, I used to teach political philosophy. <laughs> that was my, my former career. My training has, <laughs> has been very much grounded in mindfulness and this idea of cultivating more awareness. And so I think that's my starting point when I think about somebody who's looking to shift their relationship or looking to shift their own individual experience of life. The first set of questions I would bring to that inquiry is, well, how aware are you of what's happening, right? Like trying to, to cultivate a greater sense of awareness or consciousness or intentionality around the patterns that are playing in the background. Because when, when we don't have mindfulness, when we don't have awareness, we're basically just operating on the basis of these automatic habits that are running in the background, these sort of, it's a trance-like state. And, and so mindfulness is really that tool that allows us to begin to see with more clarity what's getting in our way. And then from that, to have more choice about how we wanna construct our life or our relationships, our marriage. And so I, I really see that as a, a key move when it comes to transformation. And then you mentioned your background in philosophy and as a professor, and part of your background is music and having a love for jazz. Tell mm. us the influence and impact philosophy and jazz and music has had in your life. Yeah. Well, they've all been huge influences. So I early on when I was in college, I wanted to be a jazz musician and and that was one of my main passions. And and through jazz, I think I learned about the power of improvisation and the power of presence. I mean, if you're if you're a jazz musician, the the essence of what you're trying to do is be fully in the moment while you're improvising, while you're listening to the other musicians to be fully embodied and in that moment so that you can respond with something interesting and, and have this kind of musical conversation. So I, I feel like that was jazz. Philosophy was incredibly useful for me because it was really a training in how to think systematically and how to break down problems in, in such a way that, that you could sort of like distill them down to their essence. So the 8080 marriage, just as an example, I think what makes it different from many marriage books is I really thought of this as a, as a piece of philosophy versus a book on psychology, right? So what I mean by that is in philosophy, we're often looking at how do we shift from things as they are to things as they could be? Like what, what is the ideal structure and mindset of a marriage? And what's separating that from things as they are? And then how can we make that leap from things as they are to things as they should be? So, so really, I guess, informs the way I think about writing and the way I think about how we create a model for optimizing something or relationships. And Nate, speaking of writing, with 8080 Marriage published and out in 2021 and all the accolades and reviews that that book got, you didn't waste any time. Is that you're working on a new book called open, finding freedom in a screen addicted and divided world. Tell us about the book and you know what you're working on. Yeah. Well, this is the new project and I'm actually just about finished with the first draft. So it's going to be out in January, 2024. It's exciting stuff. It's exciting. Yeah. And, and it's basically a book. This is another book that it just felt like we are living in a time where there are these unique forces that are causing us to close down to our lives. Things like digital addiction are the draw of the devices we carry around in our pockets, but also things like the increasingly politically polarized world we live in, where our neighbors no longer just have a different perspective. They're, they're the enemy because they believe something different than us. So in the midst of all that, the, this new project is really about how do we open more to other people, but even to our own minds, to our emotions, to the, the feelings of discomfort that lead us to reach out to our screens in the first place? So it's so looking at think... practices like psychedelics, meditation, really opening to the other side politically. How do we do that? And what does that look like? And then when you mentioned the technology and sort of our devices, what yeah. has been 
that you've seen really the impact, the negative impact and the concerning impact of devices, technology on human interaction and relationships? Well, I mean, it's interesting. This is a good bridge between those two projects because when we would interview couples, we expected to hear about all the fights that they were in and disagreements and, and that that was one of the main sources of tension. But actually what we found is that one of the main sources of suffering in modern relationships is this experience of disconnection at the hands of technology. What I mean by that is we would hear these stories of people saying, yeah, at the end of every day, we're sitting on opposite sides of the bed, tablets in hand, one person's surfing Instagram, the other person is doom scrolling the news. <laughs> and as a result, there's just not very much room for connection. And for many couples, even when they go out on date night, right, there's this draw of checking the latest text message or sending that last email. And, and so these devices really have gotten in the way of intimacy and connection. So when it comes to the relationship side of things, I mean, I think for people who are looking for a way out of that, going on date nights without your phone, amazing if you can do it. Some people can't, right? I mean, that's taking your me, phones that's out of the bedroom. Yeah, another it's, giving, thing. it's giving me anxiety just thinking about it, not having access to your email. But you're right, because the spark just for so many people, especially during the pandemic, when people are on their computers, on their devices, yeah. people were not going out to restaurants, traveling, and obviously things are much, much better right now, but so many people were connected to their devices yeah. because of the times that we were living in. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the unique thing about our devices is that it's not just that we're distracted by them, it's that we crave the distraction of our devices. For many of us, this is a full-on behavioral addiction that we have for our devices. And that's, I think, what makes this problem so difficult and so interesting is that we a big, the biggest part of us wants to connect with our spouse when we're sitting there in the kitchen with them. But our lower brain is driving us to grab the phone and check Instagram or check the text or check, check our email because we get that really short fleeting moment of pleasure, that hit of dopamine in our brain. And so that's a really big challenge. You know, we, we know what's best for us. We know what I, we want, but we're drawn almost habitually to this other behavior that's pulling us away from that. Nate, I have to tell you, I'm excited for that book to come out in January 2024. The book you have out now with your wife, Kaylee Clamp, 8080 Marriage, is absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Tell everybody where they can pick up a copy of the book and learn more about everything that you're doing. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, Evan, for having me on. This is really just an awesome, fun conversation. In terms of finding out more, we have a website, 8080marriage.com. You can learn more about the book there. We also have a free newsletter that goes out every couple of weeks where we have tips and strategies and a, a free guide to Epic Date Night there as well. So there's a lot of resources there to check out. And then we're also on Instagram. That's another place to find us, 8080 Marriage. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, those are the best spots. That's, that's great. Nate, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Evan. Episode 53 of the Shine On Podcast, Season 3. What a show, what a guest. Nate Clint, co-author of The 8080 Marriage. He was fantastic. New segment, Ask Evan, and more of what you love, The Docket and Producer Dave of the Boston Podcast Network. What a start to season number three. We're in mid-season form as far as I'm concerned, Evan. Looking forward to more. I'm fired up, Dave, and thank you to all the listeners. You can listen to the podcast on all major podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. Follow the podcast and subscribe. Big things to come in 2023. I'm Evan Shine, and I'll talk to you again real soon.